As gamers, we have all encountered at least one game that we felt was just too difficult. While we don't often ask, after we've broken our controllers or cussed out a boss, was whether or not the game was too hard for us, or too hard in general. Moreover, how do we determine whether a game's difficulty is, in fact, too hard for everybody? Maybe the enormous challenge that you face in a game like Dark Souls or Crash Bandicoot or Super Meat Boy is integral to the game's identity. If you were to remove difficulty from those games, it would be like removing the spice from spicy food. But are there times where a game is too hard? Maybe due to bad game design or sadistic developers? Probably, but again, one must not be too hasty to dole out that criticism. For example, Pathologic 2. For me personally, Pathologic 2 is the hardest game I've ever played. In fact, it's too hard for somebody of my sensitive temperament. Struggling to survive amidst a plague-stricken town where every little decision you make can result in somebody's life or death causes me too much personal stress. I'm not the only one either. The game's difficulty was a sticking point for many of those who played it. But does that mean it's too hard in general? Should the game be made easier in order to appeal to a large audience? To that, I would say hell no. And it's not for a reason you might expect. It's not because the difficulty is integral to the gameplay, though it certainly is. Rather, it's because it's integral to the story. If the game were made any easier, the core message of the story would become defiled, stripped of its profundity. Though most people, I'd say around 90 plus percent, who play Pathologic 2 will not bear witness to that message, the small percentage that do bear witness will be rewarded with something glorious, something that is unparalleled in the world of gaming. I would like to explain what that glorious message is, even though I technically shouldn't. What you should do before hearing that message is go and play Pathologic 2. You don't need to beat it, necessarily. You just need to play it until it becomes too difficult for you. It is only when the game has beaten you down that you will be able to appreciate the game's message for all of its emotional tenor and terror. Trust me, it'll be worth it. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. To explain Pathologic 2's core message, I need to explain its core theme. And it's one that I've been discussing a lot lately. The problem of free will versus determinism, or free will versus fate. There are multiple perspectives on this problem, and they're not limited to the halls of academia. They're also pondered in the world of video games. Final Fantasy IX posits a universe where free will is non-existent. The Legacy of Kane games show us a world where free will does exist, but it is something that only one or two beings may possess. Pathologic 2 is somewhat similar in that free will might be something that can be attained. If it can be attained, it is only by overcoming immense suffering. Although it could be worse if the character of Mark Immortel is anyone to go by. Mark, the theater director, is the first character you meet in the game. He is obsessed with trying to overcome death, and he figures the only way it can be done is if he can find someone who embodies the archetype of a god-man. I appreciate that this phrase might be difficult to understand if I just state it outright. It's easier to understand if I explain it symbolically, just as Mark tries to do using the theater. The theater is the perfect metaphor for the problem of fate slash determinism. Everything is pre-planned, predestined. Actors are given their scripts, their marks. If you believe that human beings are slaves to fate slash determinism, then the real world is very much like the theater. Some might say it is indistinguishable from the theater. After all, if actors are just imitating people or characters that came before, aren't human beings somewhat the same? This is where the tragedians come in the characters that Pathologic 2 is most famous for. As you go about the town in the game, you'll often see these tragedians interspliced with the general population. Aside from their spooky demeanor, they aren't much different from everybody else. The only thing that is different is that they are trying to act out the part of somebody who existed before them. In this way, human beings aren't much different from the tragedians. Think about it. 
What is it that we do in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, we try to embody an idea or ideal, just as an actor does. If you're a religious person, let's say, you might try to act out an ethical code. If you're a Christian, you try to act out what Jesus would do in your day-to-day -day life. Christians try to be reflections of Christ, just as the tragedians are also reflections, reflections of somebody who already existed. The benefit of being an actor or reflection is that you have greater insight into the person you are imitating. You can observe them from the outside, understand their motivations and mannerisms. This is why the tragedians often seem to possess greater knowledge of people and events compared to anybody else. It's because they've studied the characters and the setting. But this prompts the question, is the game one big stage play? And what happened to the people that the tragedians are trying to imitate? The game brilliantly abstains from providing a clear response. Anyways, let's say you were trying to imitate or act out the ultimate ideal. Well, what is the ultimate ideal? Maybe it's somebody who is able to overcome death. Mark Immortel is obsessed with this idea, that a person can charge themselves by an ideal, just as a particle charges itself, and thus embody the ideal. This ultimate ideal is able to overcome the confines of mortal existence, to go off script and improvise, to not let death be equal to the curtain's collapse. Thus, Mark is particularly interested in people like Artemy Barak, the character you play as. This is because, in Mark's mind, Artemy seems to come closest to embodying this archetype. Even characters like the Inquisitor take notice. She notes that Artemy is freer than other men, as though his strings are pulled by some manner of god. It's almost like Artemy's strings are being pulled by that ideal. The ideal of someone who is able to overcome the worst possible suffering, including death, while also being a healer to many just like the aforementioned Jesus. Whether or not it's possible to do this is still in question, and I'm not just speaking in regards to Artemy Barak. Neither the game nor real life provides us with a clear answer to this question. The responsibility one must shoulder in order to transcend death is damn near impossible to bear. This is why other characters in the game will consciously or unconsciously shirk the responsibility. The prime example of this lies with the collectivist tribe known as the Kin, a tribe that Artemy bears some relation to. Unlike Artemy, who tries to embody the archetype of a sort of divine individual, the Kin try to embody the archetype of a divine collective. There is no semblance of self if you are a member of the Kin. There is only the group you belong to. Again, to get a better understanding of what this means, it is best to explain in symbolic terms. While wandering through the town in the game, you might notice its peculiar layout, especially when you look at a map of the town. This is because it is meant to match the physiology of the kin's primary deity. That deity is Bostrak, the bull god. The kin view themselves and the earth to be individual components of the body of their god, and in order to function properly as a part of that body, one must remove their sense of self. They exist in order to serve the collective whole, that being the body of Bostrak. If a part of the body were to go rogue, like some sort of cancer, it would threaten the stability of that collective whole. So, they must function as an Udurk, or a body that contains many bodies within. There are benefits to being a member of the kin. The primary benefit is that the plague you struggle against in the game does not affect the kin. This is confirmed towards the end of the game when you enter the abattoir and speak to an actual heart known as Zirkin's Small Chamber. This heart says that the plague is only lethal to humans, but not to those who forget the word I. As long as you serve the collective, you do not have to bear the pain of individual consciousness. You can simply live as an unconscious cog in a greater machine. But you must ask yourself, would you really want this? Being unconscious means freedom from the pain of consciousness, but it also means being like a beast. It is a retreat from the evolutionary process. 
a return to a time where you were just a cog in the universe's machine and weren't trying to break free. This is a tempting offer to some, to leave behind the pain of being a conscious human and return to some sort of animalistic hive mind, like that of the kin. It's especially tempting if you believe that free will doesn't exist. At one point in the game, we see a character named Grief struggle with the possibility that free will doesn't exist. Here's one quote from him. You go about living and breathing all that, not a thought spared for your place in it all. But actually, you're pulled around by great strings. You think you're alive, but you ain't, pal. You ain't. The strings that he refers to symbolize one's slavishness to their fate. Some people, be it in this game or in real life, have made peace with such a notion, but not grief. If his life is fated to a predetermined path, then so are many other things, including the emergence of the plague. Worst of all, the tremendous suffering and death that the plague brings is predetermined. If free will is an illusion, then that means there is no escaping that tremendous suffering. When grief considers this, he despairs. Quote, I don't want to live like that anymore. Perhaps I don't want to live at all. He doesn't want to lose his sense of self and live unconsciously, like the kin do. But he also can't bear the responsibility and pain of consciousness. No wonder he contemplates suicide. His perspective is certainly understandable, especially in the context of this game. And I'm not just talking about the unforgiving brutality of the plague. I'm referring, once again, to the game's difficulty. On more than one occasion, you'll feel as hopeless and helpless as the residents of the town, unable to help the sick and unable to stave off your own death. Matters are made worse when you inevitably die, because the game becomes harder every time you do. This mechanic is what will inevitably make 90 plus percent of people turn off the game, a choice which would reflect grief's desire to give up in the face of impossible odds. But with that established, I would still say that the game's difficulty should not be altered. After all, deification is reserved strictly for those who face impossible odds and nonetheless choose to struggle forward. And the people that choose to do this are almost always in the vast minority. That's because very few will be able to embody that perfect archetype, the one that Mark Immortel desperately seeks. That is the glorious message that Pathologic 2 conveys, and it would not have been possible if the game weren't as difficult as it is. Now I must ask, in the face of that near impossible difficulty, what do you choose? A return to an unconscious state like the kin? Or would you attempt to transcend your mortality without any promises that it's even possible? These choices are reflected in the game's two primary endings. One is called the nocturnal ending, and the other is called the diurnal ending. The ending you receive rests on your decision to let a building known as the Polyhedron be demolished by an outside army. The Polyhedron represents transcendence, a reality that goes beyond human comprehension. This is due to its impossible, gravity-defying structure. It's also due to the fact that it's occupied by children and is, according to them, a place where dreams come true. Of course, only the children can see these miracles, because they occupy a sort of intermediary space between the kin and the adults of the world. On the one hand, they are trying to develop their individual sense of self, but on the other hand, they are still relatively unconscious innocence. They still believe in a world where magic is possible. If you choose the nocturnal ending where you preserve the polyhedron, this allows the world of miracles to be maintained and a return to a state of greater unconsciousness, evidenced by the kin moving into the town. If you choose the diurnal ending, the polyhedron is destroyed and the town is preserved. Even though this means the world of miracles will die out, it is nonetheless the progressive choice. After all, when the polyhedron falls, it spills what is known as living blood. Artemy is able to use this living blood to create a panacea, one that can help cure the town. It's also progressive because it means the remaining humans can maintain their sense of self and continue to evolve. 
taking the miraculous blood for themselves symbolizes a closer approximation to the archetype of a god-man, the one that Mark Immortel sought. They are no longer subservient to a god, but have taken on abilities akin to a god. As a quick side note, this was the aim of the Christian alchemists. They sought what was known as the Aqua Permanence, a magical curative potion that was likened to the blood of Jesus. In John 19.34, the crucified, deceased Jesus had his side pierced by a lance. What poured out was a mixture of blood and water. This fluid was the living water, the Aqua Permanence. To drink and bear this water would transcend you, just as it did for the town in Pathologic 2. It is the reward that would justify any amount of suffering, one that could cure a seemingly uncurable disease. But unfortunately, like I said before, only a select few people will be able to act out the archetypal life of a savior, a healer who suffers and dies. But if you act out the archetype perfectly, who knows what might happen. Thank you so, so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit that like button. It seriously helps me out a lot. If you want to see more in-depth analysis of Pathologic 2's mythology and philosophy, please share this video around. There's still so much left to analyze, like the identity of the Rat Prophet, the Executors, and the seemingly conscious nature of the plague. If this video drums up enough attention, it'll tell me that you guys are enthusiastic for those additional videos. Finally, if you like the work I do here, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Doing so will help me produce more of this type of analysis and explanation, where I go above and beyond your average game theory video. It will also help me produce more content surrounding proper mental health, which is this channel's other primary goal. If that sounds like the sort of thing you want to help promote, then click on the link to my Patreon, which you will find in the description box below. Until my next video, just remember to stay yellow.